Hello and welcome to another programme in the series Reflections here on BBC Radio Cambridgeshire. Now essentially, as you know, it's a chat show during which my guest of the week takes us through the events which have formed the pattern of their life thus far. My guest this week, born and bred in the county, is one of those people and one of a very significant number of local people of whom it can be fairly said have quite literally been to hell and back. He's Arthur Warren, presently chairman of the Cambridge Yasame Club, and I asked him first about the organisation's activities. The FIPO movement came about because there was a movement to get compensation from the Japanese for what we had endured. And uh, the government of the day, to cut a long story short, they froze Japanese assets in this country and also sold the railway we were bi- we'd built. That brought in a few million pounds, which was paid into the government funds, and each one of us eventually received a total of about £72 for those three and a half years. And uh, it was hoped that this could be improved, and so up and down the country... FIPO clubs were formed to do all the paperwork that this claim, as we called it, uh, required. And those clubs are still going strong today. Some have moved from one town to another, but uh, we're still a very strong movement. The thing is that each club is its own entity and it looks after its members and the FIPOs in the area according to their needs. We are not told how we may spend our money. We raise money by draws and social events and so on. But we also have some national funds, of which, incidentally, I'm a trustee, from which we can call on for larger sums of money than a local club can cope with. And in the first year's home, of course... Many of the chaps had got children and there was educational needs then. So a lot of our money was spent on educating the children of FIPOs. But also a lot of money was spent too on getting immediate medical aid for the folks who could... who fell through the net of the social services at that time. Because we pride ourselves that we can give immediate help. Nobody receives any actual money. We look after the money side. We will foot the bill. And we also look after all our widows. In this town, for example, we have on our books over 100 FIPO widows that we keep an eye on and help at Christmas. And I know this goes on up and down the country. What do you mean when you use the word FIPO? Far East Prisoner of War anyone who was a prisoner of war of the Japanese for that period, those three and a half years. Our club is uh, within the federation of FIPO clubs and associations, and we still do whatever we can to help each other. Uh, There's still a very, very strong bond of fellowship amongst FIPOs. Uh, We were all told, whoever came home, that our lives had been shortened by anything up to 20 years uh, because of what happened in Thailand and Malaya and in in other islands in the uh, Far East as prisoners. And uh, to have the thought of war behind you all the time affects people's health. And to think that we can look forward to a new day each day to us, to us FIPOs, every new day is a bonus. And the first thing we all do as soon as we wake up is literally to say thank you. It's an extra day. A day that we could never have expected to have all those years ago. We lived and suffered so closely together and now we live to help each other. Arthur, where were you born? In Romsey Town, in Cambridge in August 1917. What was your father's job? He was an engine driver. Unfortunately, he died when I was very young, 
uh, and so my memory of him is a, a little vague. Did you have brothers and sisters? Two brothers, and we were completely a railway family except for myself. What school did you go to? Uh, to the Romsey School and then to the Central School, as it was then, on Parkside. And what age did you leave school? A fraction before my 14th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and you went then to work where? To Selwyn College. That was a time when employers phoned a school headmaster and said, we want so-and-so. And so the headmaster sent me to Selwyn and uh, I got the job of bursar's secretary at the age of 14. Did you require very much then by way of references? Oh, yes. The headmaster was very strict on this and uh, would only recommend people he thought would fit the, uh, fit the job uh, on offer. Are you um, married? Yes, very happily. Do you have any children? Two sons, two lovely sons. One is a doctor and the other is an architect. Oh, uh, they've done all right anyway. Then, yes, they? uh, they're very good chaps. Next generation? Two grandsons. Ah, splendid. Yes. Eh? Talking my language now. I see. Well, we're, we're only allowed to say a little bit about them, do you see, or else yeah. I get into trouble. Anyway, um, were you called up into the army or did you join voluntarily? I was called up. I was one of the first batch of conscripts. That's very early January 1940. And uh, was told to report to Ipswich. And uh, we foregathered on the station at uh, Ipswich and a territorial corporal tried to march us up the main street to a, st <laughs> <laughs> to a school in Ipswich uh, where we stayed all day fed with food in um, odd cardboard boxes and so on nobody said what we were to do or where we were going and it wasn't until dusk that we were herded out again down to the railway station and put on a train and eventually landed up in North Walsham uh, in Norfolk where an RSM took us round all the houses and said two in there, one in there, three in there, and so on. You know, it was uh, looked very much a casual affair then. But then winter came, and uh, that was a very snowy winter in Norfolk. This was in the Suffolk Regiment, yeah, in the 5th Battalion, the Suffolk Regiment. Mm -hmm. And so apart from getting up early and uh, doing our run up the Norfolk Road in shorts and boots all amongst the snow, much of our training was done indoors. And I'll always remember doing Bren gun practice in the co-op hall, which happened to be over the shop at the co-op. And you can imagine army boots thudding on the floor and bodies landing on the floor. The manager was forever coming upstairs and saying... I can't hear what my customers are saying. <laughs> 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 they were the days. They were very happy days, though, really. With no foretaste of what was to come, what happened next? Well, then we were, were sorted out to rifle companies and given certain jobs. Uh, and we were deployed along the North Norfolk coast, dug in on the Norfolk, Norfolk coast, ready for the first threatened invasions of the Germans. Invasion of the Germans. That was... Very bitter, very hard. And eventually we went to various places in England <clears throat> and Scotland and Wales as well. Um, but uh, after we were supposed to have a rest after being on the, uh, on the coast, and uh, eventually we landed up in Scotland, in Hoyk, Peoplesheer, where there were no men about at all. They'd all been called up. So the place was full of ladies. The shops were full of ice cakes, to our amazement. They'd never heard an air raid siren. Within 48 hours of our being there, of course, the siren went. And the whole town erupted into the street, didn't know where to go. And we stood by in amazement because we'd been employed in the Blitz at Liverpool, for example, uh, at night, clearing up the debris and collecting people out of bomb buildings and so on. There were several what I call good schemes we went on, one particularly across into Wales. From Wales, then, what next? Eventually, I found myself in Lempster in Herefordshire, well-known for its sheep market, 
and it was a joy every week to see the different coloured sheep. They'd all been dipped orange in orange and lovely colours, all coming down the street. And it was there too that uh, we took off uh, for Liverpool to go abroad. But to see us marching down the main street at Lemster on the way to the railway station with our full tropical kit uh, <laughs> in, in October um, must have made the uh, local population stand and stare. But uh, we sailed from Liverpool, not knowing where we were going, but we headed right up into the North Atlantic took a really northern circle and finished up in um, Halifax and Nova Scotia. We anchored out in the bay and at night, the first night we were there, the lights came on. And of course we hadn't seen lights for ages and ages and the whole ship went suddenly deathly quiet to see this sight of all the lights coming on. It hit us that we'd been, shall we say, living in darkness for so long. However, we were transferred then to uh, American liners, and this, of course, was before um, the Americans were officially in the war. Uh, I was on the uh, liner Manhattan, which had been used for film stars' cruises. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but that was very interesting, and the food was out of this world, of course. Uh, the crew were mainly uh, U.S. Marines and Coast Guards, tremendous fellows, and had to be fed very well. And so we fed very well with them. So well, in fact, that after some time, the uh, English officers complained that we were eating too well and the food was cut down a bit, but not to a great degree. Uh, we left Halifax and kept fairly close to the coast. So close, in fact, that uh, we saw the lights of New York and uh, carried on right down to... Uh, the West Indies. We really went down as far as the River Plate, where there was a great battle with the Graf Spey, you may mm -hmm. remember. Yeah. Uh, and then shot off to the West Indies, where fortunately, myself and a friend of mine, we were told to accompany the CO ashore. Once we got there, the CO said, well, he said, you, you do what you like, as long as you come back at night on the, on the Liberty boat. So we kept with the, um, with the American sailors and had a wonderful afternoon ashore. Coming down the main street, to the Americans' amazement, was an Austin 7. Uh, you remember the little tiny Austin 7 indeed, with the wire wheels? Indeed, yeah. And uh, four people in it. And so the Americans had never seen anything like this. They strung out across the road uh, and stopped this Austin 7. Uh, looked all around it, couldn't actually believe it. Uh, so they picked it up with four people inside <laughs> <laughs> and turned it round <laughs> and set it back the way it had come. Uh, they were in joyful mood and uh, they stayed that way all the afternoon. And uh, especially when we got, had to come back. One American in particular, I remember, he had somehow won or purchased a goat. Um, <laughs> And so he came down onto the quayside, leading this goat on a piece of rope. The, the American Marine Patrol on the quayside, in effect, he politely said, well, you can't bring this on board, and tapped the chap on the head with his baton and let the goat go free. And the goat immediately turned round and ran to the chap who had been following him all the way down the road. So goodness knows how many times that goat had been sold. He went straight back to the bloke it belonged to. Then, of course, we went to... Um, round the Cape, and that was a sight to see. I was fortunate enough to be on deck illegally when we went round the Cape, and uh, it was the first time I really acknowledged the force of nature and how little we humans are. To see those immense vessels just tossed about like corks, it was a marvellous sight. And then, of course, it was Christmas time in uh, Cape Town. Uh, shops... Uh, with all the summer dresses for the ladies, but the Christmas decorations up. I wanted to see as much as I could while I, a short time I was there. And I had a marvellous trip to the top of Table Mountain. After Cape Town, where to next? Straight to India, where I experienced my first sign of what I call real poverty, abject poverty. Stayed there some time, 
and then to Singapore, as it turned out. And when we landed in Singapore, we could see things were not as they should have been. The place was in a panic, and the civilians were fighting to get on the boat that we were getting, uh, getting off. In fact, things were so bad that the RAF were also joining with the civilians and getting on the boat that we came off. So we had no air cover at all while we were in Singapore. But uh, we were quickly taken up to positions on the coast, on the northeast coast of Singapore. And because the Japanese were coming down Malaya so quickly and we had to try and keep them away or, or at least hold them up. Was there a reason then for the, um, for the RAF being moved out? Was this ever justified at all? It's a closed book, I think, really. The RAF had got no planes there to help us at all. There was no hope that uh, they could help us in any way, I think. And the Japanese air superiority was uh, very quickly evident in their blanket bombing uh, both of the island and also parts of the mainland. Fighting was very, very different from what we'd been trained for because Malaya and lots of Singapore, of course, is under rubber trees, and they're all planted in straight lines, diagonal lines, so that uh, you've got no field of fire, practically, at all. Are you saying, then, that the training that you had received was useless? Not entirely useless, because we were trained for hand-to-hand -hand combat as well, of course, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, for open warfare that we were going to anticipate in... Uh, in the desert, for example, uh, was completely useless from what uh, in, in Singapore, in the conditions there. And um, the whole of Singapore was still almost like peacetime. Uh, the civilians wouldn't accept that there was a war on until almost we walked into their houses uh, and made defence positions of them. It was absolute chaos and we had some very very fierce battles with the Japanese particularly down in the, on the Bakatima Road uh, when and you'll hardly believe this uh, the Japanese brought tanks de right down the road for us and what we got rifles uh, and perhaps the odd bofa and uh, so it, it was a bit hairy for a, a, a long time and uh, the key to the surrender of Japanese is really the fact that uh, the water supply to the whole island uh, was threatened by the Japanese and, were and got into Japanese hands. And things were so bad already there because the uh, malaria drains, uh, nothing had been done about them so that, uh, that they were filled with dead bodies and dead animals. And so without water, the whole place was going to just fade away. You're talking in tens of thousands. This is the terrible thing, that um, all these men, uh, fit fighting men, should suddenly come to nothing and uh, be treated by the Japanese as disposable slaves. In fact, we were told in no uncertain language that we were no good soldiers, therefore we didn't count for anything at all. And in fact, one of the Japanese officers, when we eventually got onto the railway job in um, Thailand, he said, you are my little white elephants. And that's the truest words we've ever heard, I think. We were literally little white elephants. It was uh, a terrible time because there was no food, no rations were received from the Japanese for anyone who was sick. And the rations themselves, if you were fit, were just over a pint of rice a day, plus the odd bit of green vegetable or a bit of dried fish now and then. And to have to share that with the sick people as well, which obviously we did, um, you could hardly expect men to work the complete hours of daylight. But we did. We just had to. How did you understand what was going on in a country where the language and the culture was so far removed from yours? Well, Englishmen are very versatile and we quickly realised that we've got to learn not only Japanese but also the Thai language uh, to get by because Japanese, if he gave an order, he expected it to be obeyed immediately. 
So if you didn't understand what he was saying in Japanese, you were knocked to the ground and kicked until you did understand what was going on. That, in addition, of course, to the work, which was completely manual. I know for a fact that mechanical means were available. The Japanese captured a lot of material that would have made our work so much easier. But we were little white elephants, so everything was done by hand. No machines at all. And when you think that in approximately two years, a railway was built through cutting through mountains, built across valleys, over rivers, nearly 400 miles in under two years, and that railway was working, you can well imagine that it really was slave labour. And uh, the sick, even, at one stage, had to be taken out to work to try and speed the job up. And many, many sick people died unnecessarily there, as did fit men, of course, because if you were injured on the job, uh, you either continued or you laid there until the day was done and you were taken home, call it home, back to your camp by your companions. And this is the great thing we learnt so quickly, uh, was that we could do nothing as individuals. We could only come through this by working together, being absolute brothers, if you like, blood brothers, and help each other. Whatever was stolen in the way of food or even firewood for the uh, kitchen fires, everything was shared because it was uh, the food on offer was so minute that if we'd had our food only to ourselves, then the sick wouldn't have eaten and uh, the death toll would have been immense. It was large enough as it was, but uh, it's quite unbelievable what men can stand up to. You give the impression that you were under the heel, as it were, of a regime totally without any compassion at all. Am I reading you correctly? Oh, entirely correctly, yes. This was the big shock to us as soon as we came into contact with the Japanese, that punishment for even the slightest misdemeanour was physical, and not only physical, but it was immediate. Uh, this was something that was completely foreign to us. And also, of course, the soldiers who were looking after us were under the eagle eye of the Kempitai, which is the uh, Japanese secret police, if you like, and they were horrible people. They had the most deadly tortures. I've seen men beaten, limbs broken, their bodies completely broken, but not showing one spot of blood. These Kempitai people were experts in physical destruction. But then, of course, disease did even more destruction because there was no medical supplies and we had no clothes, no shoes in the main. And uh, just how the work was done, one honestly has to have been there to appreciate it. So many books have been written by FIPOs about times on the railway. And people have said to me, which one should I believe? Which one is the truth? My answer to that is every one of us went through the same terrible period but each one of us is an individual and we all have our own views on what happened taken overall it was the most inhuman three and a half years that one could spend but on the other hand it was the most enlightening three and a half years to show how much you can achieve with your companions and living not only for yourself but for your group. Tell me, if you will, then, the Japanese attitude towards the Geneva Convention. Well, as far as I'm aware, they were non-signatories of that interwar convention, and therefore they just played their own furrow, if you like to put it that way, and uh, ignored what we would call um, the rules of war entirely, uh, particularly in their treatment of prisoners. 
So effectively they had no known code at all. No, no. Well, if we um, accept that, and if we accept the basic principle that there should be some sort of a convention, call it whatever you may, and that they accepted none, then can you give me some idea how many men you then saw killed or murdered or whatever you'd like to call it? You were there, not me. Well, there, there's so many cases of, shall we say, neglect, which court, which I would call murder. On the other hand, I've seen a man tied to a stake, um, smothered in petrol and just set light for a minor infringement of a day-to-day -day work rule, uh, which was changed every day according to what you were doing. On another occasion, we, uh, we were actually lined up to witness somebody being beaten to death. Um, call that murder? I do, myself. And three men who attempted to escape in the early days uh, on the railway, um, some of you may not realise that right from the beginning of our prisoner of war life, we had a price of $1,000 on our head. And if any of us tried to escape and the local people brought us back, the Japanese said they would reward them with $1,000. But anyhow, the three chaps attempted to escape. They got very short distance from the camp in question and were brought back and uh, made to dig their own trench and were then lashed to cross staves and shot by the Japanese soldiers who in one case completely missed the man and badly injured the others and the English officer who happened to be in the camp asked the Japanese commander for his own revolver and finished the job off because the chaps were in such terrible agony and uh, that was murder by proxy, I reckon, too. When you tell me of these atrocities, and that can be the only word to describe what you tell me, mm -hmm. how often are we talking about? Give me some idea how much of this you saw. Well, they were three instances uh, that I saw happen on the railway in the space of a year. This is only my uh, report. Uh, other FIPOs will have seen other atrocities. Um, which is the difficulty with anyone these days uh, trying to say what really did happen because so many people uh, so many people were involved and had their own horrors to report. Did you see any others besides the ones you've told me about? Oh yes, yes, some that I'd rather not uh, go into now. Would you tell me about any more? I'd rather not at the moment. It hurts to remember them. When did you first realise that the Japanese were, in fact, on the run? When the railway was finished and running, I was fortunate enough, fortunate in, in inverted commas, to be taken back to Singapore uh, en route to Japan. Uh, eventually, we won't go into details, eventually uh, I was on a very small cargo vessel uh, and uh, we were attacked by American submarines after about three days out in the centre of the South China Sea and didn't go to Japan. The Japanese officer in charge had had enough and we went instead and finished in, up in French Indochina in Saigon. I worked there for some time on the docks in between daily American air raids and uh, shoot-ups by fighter planes. And was then I was in a small body of men, 50 chaps, who were taken up into the mountains to a French hill resort called Delat. And there we were to tunnel into the mountains and make underground headquarters for the Japanese. Quickly, in a matter of 
weeks, that is. We were taken down the mountain to a place called Torchum. And when we got there, the Japanese officer said, this is a railway junction, look around you. And it had been completely flattened by the Americans. The engines were, were all shot up and the small town had no electricity. Nothing worked. And this little Japanese officer said, the Americans did this. It's your job to make it work again. So we set to in our usual way, all manual work, nothing mechanical to help us at all. And eventually we got electricity supply working, but our work was interfered with every day, regularly at 10 o'clock. A little man sitting on top of the hill outside the village had a big gong and regularly at 10 o'clock Every morning he banged that little gong because along came the American aircraft right down the lines, shooting up again everything that they could see. However, eventually we did get uh, some rails straight. And what did we have to do there but help unload Japanese wounded S many of whom couldn't have been more than 16 or 17. They were in a shocking state, had no food. They were almost as bad off as we were. And we, by this time, couldn't stand seeing people suffer, so we helped where we could. Eventually, we had three days without any work, without being taken out to work. And in the kampong just down the road, we had heard shouts and shots being fired, and... At the end of the third day, a Japanese officer came and told us that uh, the war was over. Leaflets had been dropped and we had to be taken back to Saigon under heavy guard to keep us safe. And on all the stops en route, the local populations crowded round our train and were begging from us and we'd got nothing. They were even worse than we were. However, we got to Saigon and were taken into some French army barracks. And what should happen within hours of our getting there was the uh, local communists started shooting up the French who remained in Saigon. So what do we do? Out we go, no arms, hardly any clothes and bring in as many French people as we could to the safety of our barracks. We had uh, airdrops of clothing and food, some clothing and food, and uh, after that we actually received some money. A member of the pay corps was dropped with a bag full of money and said, in effect, how much would you like? This may seem very, seem very strange. I have been asked what was the thing I most enjoyed? What was the first thing that struck me when I was released? Because we were, after a few days, able to walk out into, Singap into Saigon. And it was the fact of being able to walk on the pavement. Being, being free. If, uh, after a few days... Uh, we were flown out to Rangoon and put into hospital and uh, there we met Mountbatten. He came in to us and uh, said that we would be all home before Christmas and uh, we were home by Christmas. In fact, I was home almost the same day to four years that I'd left England. Uh, I came back to Cambridge and uh, met that wonderful lady who's now my wife. Can I ask you what goes through your mind when you see little boats with candles on being floated down the cam to commemorate Hiroshima and Nagasaki? That's a big question to ask a FIPO, that one. To many of us, we all believe in 
people doing what they want to do. But in this case, and this we believe most sincerely, that if it hadn't been for the atomic bomb, I wouldn't be here speaking to you and millions, literally millions more Japanese would have been wiped off the face of the earth. Those two atom bombs, and I say this because I truly believe it, saved millions of lives. It certainly saved the tens of thousands of FIPO lives. And uh, if people wish to think about the Japanese people who suffered at Nagasaki, according to letters in local papers and so on, the people who float candles down, they've not any real experience of what basic life is all about. Well, may I say that we think they're wrong, that they're doing this in ignorance of all the facts. I'm not a warlike person at all, uh, far from it. But I still believe that we owe a tremendous lot to whoever it was, English and Americans, uh, for formulating those two bombs. People from Cambridge that I know helped with that. It did a terrible job, but on the other hand, it certainly saved millions of lives and has also kept the peace to this date. So effectively, you are not, in a broader sense then, opposed to um, a nuclear deterrent? Not at all. Uh, I think that has given us peace. Uh, maybe a shaky peace at times, but at least it's given us a peace from 1945 to now and has given people like me a great life, 40-odd years of extra life. We have spoken about people who float the little boats down the cam, who take the one view. I also know people, um, or particularly one man who lives not terribly far from this station, who now won't turn his back on a member of the Japanese race. Where do you stand in this uh, line? Well, in my job in a college after the war, I was dealing with several hundred of students. And amongst those, you can imagine, there were inevitably some Japanese. And when the college I was working at first admitted a Japanese, the senior tutor said to me, what are your feelings about this, Mr Warren? And I said, I've got my job to do, I'll deal with him the same as any other student. And that I tried to do. Uh, as I said before, I'm not warlike, I wouldn't hurt anybody. Uh, but I can ignore them because I'm convinced that uh, given the time, the place, the opportunity and the conditions the Japanese would act again the same as they did in 1942. And uh, that would be a terrible thing. So you ask me about the atomic bomb, and I think that's the beginning of what has kept peace for so long. Normally, at the end of Reflections, I invite my guests to share with us one particular memory, if they are to have taken from them all the others that they have. If we half accept what you've told us about your war, then on this occasion I feel disposed to turn the thing on its head and invite you to share with us the memory that you would most like to forget. That's very difficult because clearly over a period of three and a half years, um, memories come flooding back of that time but one in particular I think uh, during the building of this Thai Burma railway I was working in a, a cutting a granite cutting and we actually had there a narrow gauge railway with little tip trucks on to take the rubbish we were digging out and to pour over the cliff edge to help fill up the valley beyond. Cantonese were riding on the trucks 
and tipping the stuff over the edge. On one occasion, the, uh, the truck didn't stop. And the two Cantonese went over the edge with the truck. We started to scramble down to help these chaps, but were shooed back with the end of a rifle and made to carry on our work and continue tipping the rubbish on top of these two people until they were dead and covered. What's that um, piece of paper you have with you? Well, this was part of the submission to the War Crimes Commission uh, during, in, in the Far East after the war, and it deals with the disposal of prisons of war. And this was from the Japanese High Command. That the POWs will be concentrated and confined in their present location and under heavy guard when preparation for the final disposition will be made. And the methods of this disposition, I quote, whether they are destroyed individually or in groups, or however it is done, with mass bombing, poisonous smoke, poisons, drowning, decapitation or what, dispose of them as the situation dictates. In any case, it is the aim not to allow the escape of a single one, to annihilate them all and not to leave any traces. <laughs> 